So all of us, every one of us has kapuna and elders and ancestors that at one time or another had their hands turned to the soil. And this deep knowledge still lives in our DNA. The Hawaiians had great field systems, lo'i, and fish ponds. And for 1,500 years, they had an incredible food system in the Ahupua'a that fed a population that is as great or greater than we have today. The Hawaiians understood very well, e malama oi i ka'aina, e malama ka'aina ya oi, that if you take care of the land, then the land will take care of you. So we know that today, we know that our health is directly related to the quality of the food that we eat because the life force, the mana, lives in that food. And that food, the quality of that food is directly related to the quality of the soil that it comes from. And the quality of the soil that it comes from is directly related to the practices of the farmer who farms that soil. So our food is directly related to our farmers. We are what we eat. And as in the food, so in the mind, not only are our bodies affected by what we eat, but our very thoughts are affected, our emotions, our ability to have a spiritual life, said Rudolf Steiner in 1924. So our kupuna, our elders, our ancestors, have really given us everything that we need to know in order to pass on to future generations. They have instructed us on how to care for the land and the people in such a way that we are in balance and harmony with the world around us, and that we need to do this in order for generations to live. So our first speaker tonight, many of you may know, Walter Ritty, was born and raised on the island of Molokai. And for those of you who don't know him, in 1975, Walter came together with a group of young men from Molokai, George Helm, Emma Luli, Charlie Maxwell, and they joined together and decided to take back the island of Kaulave from the military. The military, as you know, had been using it as a bombing range, and they were very successful. And so that started Walter out on a path of activism, and since that time, Walter has really been a tireless champion for Hawaiian rights, the rights of communities, the rights of the water, the rights of the land, and not only on Molokai, but really all across the state of Hawaii. Walter is an educator, He's an avid fisherman, hunter, and planter since he was a child. And for the last seven years or so, he has tirelessly campaigned across the state for the protection and preservation of Halo Akekolo, the Hawaiian taro. I feel very blessed to be standing behind Haloa tonight. Stopping big cruise ships from docking at Molokai, or saving the lovely lands of La'au. And speaking out about the idea of no ownership of life has really occupied Walter's time over the years. So um, tonight, I want to tell a Walter Ritty story, okay? Everybody got to tell a Walter Ritty story this week, but me, so. Uh, okay, so this is my Walter Ritty story. So, um, one Friday, I was in my office, and I got a phone call from the science editor of the Honolulu Advertiser. And he said, have you seen the, um, the agenda of the Department of Agriculture at their meeting next Tuesday? And I said, no, I don't, I don't look at their agenda. And he said, oh, you should go in line and look at it, like right now. So I looked at it, and they were going to be discussing the uh, trial 
of genetically engineered pharmaceuticals that were going to be engineered into algae, seven different medicines. There was AIDS vaccines, hepatitis C vaccines, and, and these were going to be engineered into our most common water and soil alga in the state of Hawaii, Clemenomonas reinhardii. And so they were going to be grown out in kind of big plastic bags on the ocean front at Mira Pharmaceuticals in Kona. And so at the Tuesday meeting of the Department of Agriculture, they were going to okay this field trial. But it hadn't gone through USDA or APHIS or anything. It was just kind of put through. And so he suggested, you know, I should come over and say something about this. So that morning, all my colleagues that I work with had left and gone to Europe. And there was no one around. And so I spent the weekend um, trying to call out to uh, Kahea, out into the state, people who might be able to come over to, the, um, to, the, to make testimony on that Tuesday. So as it happened, um, Sarah Sullivan and I went over there that morning. We flew over and we came into the room and sat down and were waiting for the nine members of the Department of Agriculture board to sit down. And there was no one there except all the scientists from all these companies that had genetically engineered these algaes. And um, it was kind of a scary moment because the room was filled with people that were going to testify for this experiment. And I could only see two of us in the room that were going to testify against the experiment. And so the, the meeting started and everyone was getting up to say all the wonderful things that would happen um, because you, you could make pharmaceuticals so cheaply by doing this and, you know, whatever. And so, as I was just thinking that um, all was lost here, the doors open and, on, and two young men step inside, Hanahana and Kalani Ua, um, Walter's two sons. And they like this. <laughs> and they have on bright yellow t-shirts, and on the front of it it says, Hawaiian Security Force. <laughs> I could see some of the members of the Board of Ag and then Walter walks in between them. My hopes were lifted. <laughs> they go to the back table and they sign in. Some of the, some of the um, local guys on the Board of Agriculture were kind of shaking at that time. I'm thinking, oh, this is good. Okay. So, um, so they all, when, when it's time for them to give their testimony, they come up to the table, all three of them together. I've never really seen this happen at the Department of Agriculture. I mean, usually it's one person at a time that comes to testify. So they all come and sit down, and then they just go right down the row, and they all give them an awe about why this is a really bad idea to um, you know, grow pharmaceuticals in the most common alga. You know, I mean, this could, if one drop got out onto, um, on, out of the bag, it could actually um, solarize up into the air. It could mix with other water in the area. It could just freely exchange its genes. It could go up and move in a cloud and rain down on something. Of course, we didn't know that at the time, but we learned all, all this later. So this actually was quite serious. So as the boys were speaking and Walter was speaking, all of a sudden the board started getting very agitated. And when he was finished, some of the local guys that were on the board started questioning the other guys that, um, you know, this probably isn't a very good idea. They got into an argument and they re it started to get really heated. And um, um, Sandra Kunamoto, who was the chair at the time, was pounding her gavel on the, on the, uh, on the table and, and telling everyone to stop, you know, that just calm down. And so that day, that field trial was stopped. Yeah. 
So m mahalo, Walter, um, to you and your ohana, because many, many times um, you have come to the aid of all of us, and really um, your dedication to this has really helped to change the course of history. So please, a warm welcome for Walter Ritty from Life. Aloha Kauai. I want you to know that this island is very famous on the island of Molokai. We all know that Kauai was never conquered by Kamehameha. And we know that it was because of Kauai that these cruise ships are not going island to island. We have a lot in common between Kauai and Molokai, and I'm really, really glad to be here. And I have to admit that I came here, well, I didn't come here to do it, but I stole one of the most precious things that came from this island of Kauai, and her name is Loretta Pereira. <laughs> from Kala Hill. You know, it's been, this week has been like, oh, you know, sometimes your weeks go like this, and then sometimes it goes like this. This week it has just been going like this. And tonight it's like, wow, I, I couldn't believe my eyes when I came in here. You know, I had to ask, myself, wow, what's happening on Kauai, you know? <laughs> we don't have a room, you know, on Molokai is just like this section would fit in, the, in our biggest room, and, and this is like, Wow, you know, and this has been happening all week. Beyond expectation, what has been happening. So the first thing I'd like to do is, is, is kind of like say mahalo, yeah? You always need to kind of step back and, and say mahalo. And I want to look at that lady over there and, and give her a really big look, you know, of aloha and aloha to her for coming all this way, going through snowstorms and everything else and coming to Hawaii to share her mana'o. <laughs> and this guy right here? He's the guy that taught us the intricacies of this GMO stuff, along with Bill Freeze over there. Bill, aloha, Bill. We didn't know anything about GMOs, nothing. If any of you try to sneak onto the island of Molokai, good luck, okay? Because you cannot come in our airport without everybody on the island knowing who came on our island. <laughs> the only corporation that was successful in sneaking onto our island of Molokai was Monsanto. Monsanto. That tells you that these guys are sneaky experts. Sneaky, sneaky. Because they were there a good four to five years before we even know or knew that they were there. I mean, it was like, wow, they're scary. So the first thing we did was to find out, well, who are these guys? And then we went onto this magic thing called computer and this thing called Google. Wow, you should try that and, and Google these guys, Monsanto. You're gonna blow your mind. These guys are bad guys. We had bad guys on our farmlands. Bad guys. They, the trail that they left behind of all the places that they've been, we were really, really scared about what was gonna to happen to our island. So what is happening to Molokai is happening to Kauai, big time. I came early, we took the early flight, got up about uh, four o'clock this morning so that we get all our family together and come to Kauai because we needed to go and look what was happening to you to see if it was the same thing happening here as it was happening on Molokai. And sure enough, we went down to Hanapepe, 
And the first place we stopped was at the salt pond. And we looked at the salt pond, and if you look from the ocean, and you look above the salt ponds, you're going to see the fields that they're growing up there, all of the GMO fields. And any fool knows what happens to farmers up in the fields, especially when they leave the lands bare, which is what they're doing on Molokai also, that everything goes downhill. People there were telling us stories about great die-offs of our sea urchins in that area out in the, in the ocean. And we talked to some of the people that were living there. On the island of Molokai, we are fiercely protective of our natural resources because that is the way that we survive on the island of Molokai. We know that we have two ways of surviving. We have two economies on our island. One is a cash economy and the other is a subsistence economy. And we need both of them to survive. Most of the islands have lost one of their economies and they have been left with just a cash economy. So we fiercely protect the environment because that's how we feed our family. 33% of everything that we eat comes from our natural resources on Molokai. The skills that allow us to harvest these resources and feed our families are traditional skills. Monsanto and these chemical companies are the most destructive thing that is happening on all of our islands today. It is the number one problem that we have as people who are trying to survive in Hawaii today. It is the worst problem that we have right now. Hawaiians kept asking me, why, why are you getting involved in GMOs? You know, I, we have sovereignty to take care of. We have our rights to protect. We have to enhance these things. Why are you wasting your time on GMOs? We, you know, it's, it's like, if, you, we, if, if we are not going to learn how to feed ourselves, we can never, ever be independent, self-sufficient, and sovereign. Never. <laughs> never. I got involved in politics this year big time because I was at the legislature last year and two things happened to me. One, we went there to say to them we wanted to have a hearing to let you know of the impacts of GMOs on our children. We wanted to let you know of the impacts of GMO on our lands and on our reefs and on our water and of our air and even into the forests. And this is what happened. They put the couple sticks up. They wouldn't even allow us to have a hearing. They couldn't even say one single word to this body that we elected. The state capital shut their doors on us. And that was a horrible, horrible feeling. We tried to talk as loud as we could. We were yelling from the rotunda. Uncle Jerry was there. We were, we, were, we were trying to tell our story even though they shut all the doors on us. We were yelling, Calvin, say. We were yelling everybody's names, you know. Hear our bill, and nothing worked. We couldn't get anywhere. So I hung around. And what I saw was a war on our environment. These elected officials have joined the corporations and they have declared war on our environment. And this island has the most to lose because this is the most beautiful island in all of these islands that we have in Hawaii. 
the most beautiful. You have the most to protect. On Molokai, we fight over water every day. Water is so precious because it's so limited. This, the, I was sitting in Hanapepe down, down by the salt ponds and I'm looking at all the mountains and I just couldn't believe the view I was looking at. So if these people are declaring war on us, we need to react. What you have done here tonight is, is the reverberations of this room being filled like this, it's gonna, it's gonna go out there and it's gonna impact all kinds of things, including politics. And it's like, if we just come here and we enjoy the evening, I'm, I'm, I'm enjoying you guys and I hope you guys are enjoying all of the knowledge that you're gonna to get tonight. And you go home and you get to a super high and you're all excited and everything, and then you forget everything. Hawaiians call that poho. It's, it's my job tonight to try and instill upon you that no matter how, how many times we actually come together and listen to each other talk, talk is not just going to solve our problems. We need to try and get you to really participate, to react, and to understand that politics has joined the corporations and declared war on our environment. And if we don't do anything, we're going to lose because the environment is had become so profitable and they have used so much of it already that they're going to do anything to take the rest of it. We need all of you to participate in government. We need for you to follow the lead. You, you know, this island, this island, Hawaii Seeds, have, have, have anybody in here heard of Hawaii Seeds? Hawaii Seeds. Hawaii Seeds. Hawaii Seeds, Hawaii Seeds. Hawaii Seeds, the leadership in Hawaii Seeds has been coming out of the island of Kauai. It's because of them that this room, this room is full. Hawaii Seeds, their leadership. It's, it's these women, you know, it's these women that has all this energy and, and commitment and, and they just go, 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 go. <laughs> Oh, they're burning all my ball bearings. I cannot keep up with these women. You know, it's like... Ah, it, the leadership right now, I'm, I'm going to tell you guys, the leadership right now coming from Kauai is, the, is, is ahead of any other island, any other leadership that is going on. No other island has been able to fill rooms like this. No other island has been able to get... The other day we had hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people marching down Baratania Street. They had to close off a whole lane in order for the people to march down Baratania. They marched for at least three miles in the hot sun, yelling and letting it out all the way down. They organized that. We filled the rotunda. In that rotunda, it was unions. We had local five unions in there. We had guys who was occupying Thomas Square. They were in there. We had children. We had people pounding taro. The leadership was coming from this island, from your island. You know, it, it, it. you guys are in the lead, just like you were with the super fairies. Everybody's watching you guys one more time. Follow that lead. Keep your eye. When you see Hawaii seeds, follow that lead. Okay, because we are going to pass a labeling bill in the state of Hawaii this year. And the leadership is going to come from this island. The other big issue that we presented that day 
was called the PLDC. Who, who, who knows what the PLDC is? Ho! Gary Hoosier, you got some backers, Gary Hoosier. He's going to take the lead. He has the knowledge of the inside information on how all of this came together. He's going to take the statewide lead on this. We need to back him up and follow him on that issue. Two of the major issues coming out of Hawaii today is coming from this island, the island of Kauai, right now. So you guys, coming into this room, you are going to get information that most people will not have. It's going to be your job to take that information and spread that information. It's going to be your job to make sure you influence that state capital. You have to influence that state capital because things have happened there. The leadership has changed. The House leadership has flipped. That's right. The House leadership has flipped. The House leadership has flipped. That House leadership has been the roadblock. That's why they put the blocks up and we couldn't even get a hearing. It was because of that. And it's gone. So the doors are open for us to come in. Um, I, I wanted to talk just about, you know, this, this group over here, you, you guys are the foundation for Kauai right now. You got all the information, you got the energy, you got the unity right now, you know who to look for, you know what to watch for so that people can tell you when you're going to act because if, if we act all over the place, it's not going to work. You need to go in unison, in, in unison. I'd like to add, you know, another layer another foundation layer, and that is, that is the Hawaiian foundation. When we did our march yesterday, it was really, really important to lay that foundation down so that when we came to our politicians, we were on solid ground. And that foundation was the Hawaiian foundation. That is a very, very important foundation. We were celebrating the 120th year of the overthrow of this kingdom. And that overthrow needs to become pono. It needs to be corrected. Once that is corrected, that's going to be a foundation that all of us is going to build on. And we are going to make a better Hawaii. So support that foundation. Support that foundation. You know, there's a really great um, suspect and maybe even fear about that foundation that if that foundation is successful, if we make, if we correct the wrongs that were done, and if we make everything pono and legal again, that how it should be in Hawaii, that the changes are going to be negative. That is a false view that has been perpetuated in order to keep us where we are today. That is a false view. Uh, I'd like to give a, just a small little story to, to emphasize that point. When we first started out as young Hawaiians, you know, we, we, were, we wanted to go hunting, we wanted to go fishing. They put up gates and they put up fences and we couldn't go here, we couldn't go, go there on Molokai. They cut up our access. So without access, we couldn't feed our families. So we had no public rights to go anywhere. So we depended on our Hawaiian rights. As Hawaiians, Hawaiians have different rights than the general public. There's different rights. And those rights were handed down from generation after generation after, they were never extinguished. So we used the most powerful rules and rights that we could find in order to gain that access. And people were looking at us going, what do you mean you guys got Hawaiian rights? You ain't got no Hawaiian rights. You know, and, and we used it so successfully that we gained access to the places that the ranch was blocking and locking all of those years. Now here's the corner, here's a deep part of the story. The people that were criticizing us, 
were many of the plantation leaders. Um, and they were good people. You know, they were like Boy Scout leaders and community people. And they didn't understand what we were doing. So after we were successful, my heart was really warm because... When Elmer Cavallo, who was the mayor at that time, came to Molokai to open the gates and make a big political deal out of all of it, people lined up. All the cars were lined up because they were going to open the gates in order to go down. And the first car that was lining up at the gate early in the morning was this one Cub Scout master, and his truck was all full of his scouts. And it was a guy that was yelling at us the most about the dangers of Hawaiians becoming, having Hawaiian rights. And he and his scouts were the first people to benefit from the use of our rights. And that's the story, I think, that overall story that negates this whole picture. And it's the reality of if you build your foundation of how we're going to protect our environment on the most powerful laws that we have in the state, then those are the things that we got to do and support the Hawaiian laws and, and build that Hawaiian foundation so that all of us, all of us who care about this place, all of us who live in the beautiful island of Kauai, all of us who are environmentalists, all of us who love the environment, who has aloha aina, we are going to be successful if we all join together and rise together in unity. And that has been our story that we were telling at the, at the Capitol. And this is a story that I want to tell you here tonight, that the Hawaiians rising up is not just going to be the Hawaiians rising up. It's going to be all of us rising up together because we all have that same aloha aina and love for our environment, for our future generations. So, I just want to end by having a really good look at everybody out there and let all of your mana flow into me. And it's a really, 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 you guys should be standing up here and looking. It's just such a great feeling to see all of you here today, I mean tonight. And I know because all of you have the same mana'o that is in my punavai, in my na'au, that we all are here because we love our environment, we love our island, and we are going to protect it from hell or high water. Yeah. Mahalo, Walter. Uh, mahalo for reminding us. Aloha uh, aina, malama aina, aina mwamona. Mahalo. You know, um, I, I just wanted to tell Andy and um, Vandana, because I'm not sure you heard the story, but um, this is the very hall where Hawaii said no to the super ferry, isn't it? <laughs> Governor Lengel wanted us to have a, a big boat so that we could carry the military over to my island so they could go to Pahakaloa. But um, Kauai, actually, uh, between the surfers and, the, um, and all of you, how many of you were in this hall that night? So um, all the people from Hawaii Island mahalo you for, for that night because that was very courageous. I saw YouTube on it, it was very courageous, thank you. So um, I have a really special place in my heart for environmental lawyers. 
and environmental judges, but especially Andy Cabral. Andy really has been a champion for all of us um, for the protection and preservation of our food, our farms, and our environment for many, many years. He's the executive director of the International Center for Technology Assessment in Washington, D.C., ICTA. He is also the executive director of the Center for Food Safety with um, offices in Washington, D.C., San Francisco, and Portland. He is really one of the leading environmental lawyers in the United States. And Center for Food Safety has really aggressively been pursuing and persisting with this idea of the genetic engineering of food and its effect on communities and on health all across the nation. So in 2012, the Center for Food Safety did some of these things. They filed a petition with the FDA to require the labeling of genetically engineered foods. They have been defending alfalfa and beets from seed contamination in the courts. Yeah, the USDA okayed a beet trial, a genetically engineered beet trial, right in the middle of the Willamette Valley, where they grow all the beet seed and chard seed. And that wasn't very good thinking. He has been spending time opposing these destructive practices of genetic engineering and also exposing the practices of factory farming and irradiation. He also is challenging the patents of seed in the courts, and he testifies uh, regularly at congressional hearings and regulatory um, hearings. He has been featured in many documentaries, including The Future of Food, is the author of numerous articles and books on technology and society and food issues and the environment. And Utney Reader said he was one of the world's leading visionaries. So to give here tonight from Washington, D.C., way far on the East Coast, to give us his vision of this issue, please give a warm aloha for Andy Kimball. It is so wonderful to be back on this beautiful and abundant island. I've been here many times now. Just landing is a whole amazing experience. It's like coming home in a way. Um, I want to honor this woman who introduced me, Nancy. Uh, talk about energetic women, Walter. I mean, my goodness. I mean, not only is this woman an amazing woman of the land, if you've ever been to her farm, her husband's farm, it is the most amazing biodiverse place you can ever imagine. It brings tears to your eyes. But she's also one of the most experienced people in the legislature, an incredibly effective lobbyist in the legislature, which has I mean, done an amazing, amazing things on that. She's one of the greatest fighters against GE on this entire, really, the state. I mean, you've just done amazing jobs. And lately, I don't know how you even did this. I mean, how many school gardens have, have you? I mean, just from 65 school gardens. <laughs> you know, all, all week I felt a little bad being one of the speakers saying, well, shouldn't I MC and have... Nancy actually tell you all those things, but she, is, uh, she adds modesty to her extraordinary accomplishments. I also want to thank everyone who made this possible. Jerry DiPietro, where are you? Uh, and uh, a special thank you out to, uh, to the Series Trust. Kent and Judy, where are you? These two amazing people make so much of this happen. Thank you so much. Kent Whaley, Judy Kern, Series Trust. Thank you so much for all you do for this state, this island. Um, I can't resist, I'm sorry to say. Um, by the way, it is true that I was named one of the um, 100 leading visionaries by Utney Reader. And then they uh, asked us to, several of us, to go to Town Hall in New York City and give uh, visionary speeches. About five minutes to be a visionary, as I recall. <laughs> and uh, I was about the fifth speaker. Uh, and I noticed the first four uh, not only wore glasses, but had rather thick lenses, as I do. And it occurred to me that perhaps the prerequisite for being a visionary is that you really can't see at all. Um, so perhaps you should uh, 
take that into consideration with the rest of the stuff I'm saying tonight. Um, it's impossible with these people on stage that I'm so honored to be with, these two great comrades and friends, not to tell stories, and so I'm going to, to heck with it. Uh, I'm going to tell the first story is about Walter. Yes, I know you've already heard one, but this one's, oh, this is, I'll tell you, it's a short one, but it's great. So Bill Fries, I know he's out there, a staff scientist for CFS, a great hero too. He and I uh, went to Molokai, and um, this is right after Walter had succeeded in stopping the genetic engineering uh, of Hawaiian taro. And I remember sitting at a table with Walter and uh, Bill, and we were saying, what, what, so what's next? Actually, you said, so what's next? Because you know, that's the way you are. <laughs> and Bill and I go, oh, we've got to do something. And I, Bill, you and I said, well, patents. There's, maybe there's some patents on these tarot. Maybe there's some patents. And Walter says, they can't patent my elder brother. <laughs> so, uh, so, you know, uh, we went back. Bill and I went back. And I think, Bill, you found uh, uh, three patents, I believe, uh, on, on Hawaiian tarot that went all the way back. And these are ancient seas. Nothing to do. They've been patented by the University of Hawaii. And we sent them along. And, and to Walter, and that's the last I heard of it. And then suddenly somebody said that Walter had demanded that the University of Hawaii rescind these patents. And then the next I heard of it, there was a chain around the regents in the University of Hawaii. A chain had been, they were locked into a, a room, a, a building. And Walter and his warriors uh, had pretty much said, you're staying here until you rescind the patents. And... So the University of Hawaii uh, lawyers, you know, gave him some BS. Oh, we can't rescind the patents because somebody else will patent them, and then somebody worse than us. So we get a call. Walter's not letting him out on that excuse. And he says, uh, is this true? And I said, no, it's complete nonsense. Once you patent it, it's no longer novel. No one could patent it after that. He said, write me a couple of pages quick. I'll say you're our lawyers. <laughs> so we wrote a memo. We gave it to them, and they said, ah, oh, he's right. You know, so so uh, they gave up the patents. And I don't know if you've seen that picture of Walter and three other activists ripping up these patents. And, and, and I, I've been doing intellectual property law for a long time, patent law. And to my knowledge, it is the only time that a patent holder has ever voluntarily given up a patent, particularly under the threat of imprisonment. <laughs> so, you know, I always say, you know, they always say, if you want something done, give it to a busy man. If you want something done, give it to this man. Uh, so he's a great comrade and continues to be. Um, I met Vanda Nashiba for the first time in 1989. Uh, my organization, the Foundation Economic Trends, along with an academic organization called the World Resource Institute, held the very first global warming conference uh, among NGOs. And there was about, oh, I guess, 60 NGOs showed up, and C-SPAN uh, covered it, which was great because people, you know, really get excited when the television is there. And uh, I had not known Vanda, but she was immediately, of course, her the nobility and the beauty of her presence was just to me. I said, "Who's that woman?" That's fun. I said, okay. So it goes on. It's one of these sort of academic global warming things where they treat the direst threat up to human humanity yet as kind of like a scientific problem, you know. And uh, and they were going on and on about the developed world and the underdeveloped world and how you know what kind of thing. And so Vanda sort of makes sort of intervention. She says, "Excuse me." She said, "You know, uh, in my country, we have for millennia lived in more or less harmony with the natural world, and uh, here in the West." In less than 150 years, you've created a almost terminal threat to the planet. So from now on in this conference, why don't we call you the underdeveloped world? And you call where I come, the developed world. And they did. And they did. So I had to go speak to her afterwards, of course, not just, you know, and, and so we discovered we had a mutual interest in uh, patenting the patenting of life. So she went back to my office and we, we spent a couple of hours looking over patents and trying to figure out how we could stop this nightmare that was just emerging then. Uh, so that was my introduction to Vandana. Um, you know, I, I know most of you probably know this, but I, I want to review something for you. The last 15 years or so, and the work that not only I've done, but a huge number of you and our coalitions, I just want to sort of remind you, for example, uh, of what we've done. Uh, you remember the genetically engineered tomato, the flavor saver? Remember, some people remember that, no flavor to savor? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we defeated that. Uh, we did a boycott on Campbell's, and, and that's not here. There is no genetically engineered tomatoes. Remember, there was a genetically engineered BT potato, remember? Uh, Arpad Pushtai uh, was fired for finding out that it could hurt people. 
great scientist who, who, who was really, his reputation was destroyed by Monsanto. Well, we went to McDonald's, and uh, it's a small campus outside of Chicago of about four square miles, uh, where Monsanto lives. Everything there is a MIP, by the way. You get in the van, it's a McVan. You meet the vice president, he's the MIP vice president. That's what they call each other, I'm not kidding. So we threatened to boycott them, and uh, they gave up, and there went the BT potato, it's gone. Okay, so we just not, we then, and I don't mean just me, I mean as a coalition together, we have stopped genetically engineered wheat. Monsanto's Roundup Ready genetically engineered wheat. Imagine all the wheat products, imagine the contamination. That's been stopped. That's been stopped through the combination of legal action, and it's not here. And they're not coming back with it. Monsanto had to fire 10% of its employees because of that. Genetically engineered rice, been stopped. No commercialization. That's gone. They tried to genetically engineer bent grass, and it was called slow mo or slow grow or something like that. Scots and Monsanto. We beat them in court. That's over. That's not going to happen. Then they tried to do these biopharmaceuticals that Nancy was talking about, growing vaccines in, in, in crops. Well, we sued them and we beat them. Those are gone. Not going to happen. Not going to happen. Crazy idea. Anyway, then we stopped genetically engineering alfalfa for six years. And we're right back in court right now. Then we just recently shopped, uh, stopped the growing of these sugar beets up in the Willamette Valley. And by the way, you know, shout out to Earth Justice in Honolulu for legally stopping that algae experiment forever. So don't tell me Monsanto can't be beat. They've been beat over and over and over again. And we can do it again. And counties have gotten together. I was there in Mendocino County when a woman named Els Cooper Ryder, who ran the Ukiah Brewery, said, we're going to be the first non-GMO county in America by law. And Els organized it. I showed up with a great farmer and friend, Percy Schmeiser, who went around the county. It was fantastic because we ran the entire campaign out of the brewery. <laughs> I mean, best campaign ever, right? <laughs> we were outspent 20 to 1 by Monsanto. And we beat them. And that happened not in Marin County and in Trinity County. And remember BGH, bovine growth hormone, that horrifyingly cruel product, destroyed dairy cows? Well, Monsanto started getting in trouble because people started labeling, as you, I'm sure you all know, milk and dairy products as BGH free. Monsanto went to the Federal Trade Commission and said, they can't do that, that's mislabeling. And we went to the, we answered, no, it's not, it's accurate. We won. Then 13 different states tried, they tried uh, Monsanto tried to stop this in 13 different states. We won immediately in 12 of them. Ohio said, no, 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 it's probably wrong. They can't label, they can't label BGH free. We went to court and then finally circuit court and we won. So what did Monsanto do? They sold the product, gone. So I mean, you know. Recently, um, I uh, co-wrote the Proposition 37 in California and um, You know, we lost, uh, 51 to 49, uh, yeah, 51 to 49. They, uh, they spent $50 million, five zero by the way, five zero, fifty million million. And we, they outspent us 10 to one in, in, in TV ads and we still, 51 to 49. So uh, they know that we know how to beat them now and it's just a matter of time. It's not a matter if we're gonna have labeling, it's when. And it would be great if this were the state that did it first. And there's a labeling bill right now that you can support. Now, the patenting is not only an economic crime, patenting of life, but it also is disturbing, both spiritually, philosophically, any other way because under Section 101 of the Patent Act of the United States, do you know what you can patent? A machine, a manufacturer, or an inventor's composition of matter. I mean, how dare they in the patent office say when they patent a soy plant or a corn plant or a pig or a salmon, that that is a machine, a manufacturer, or an inventor's composition of matter. That has to stop. 
That, I mean, that, it's, 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 it's not only... So, you know, a couple years ago, if I'd been sitting, standing up here, I would have said, you know, it's pretty hard. We fought hard. Uh, our, my organization has fought very hard over the years. I don't think anybody's fought harder than Vandana Shiva. She was able to defeat Basmati, the patents on Basmati, and name, you know, those amazing things. But you know what? There's some pretty exciting news. Right now, in front of the Supreme Court, there are two cases. One we funded, one Bill Fries and our staff and others have been just really doing great work on. The first is a case that says you cannot patent the breast cancer gene or any gene. No genes are patented. And that Supreme Court will look at this year. If they say no genes are patentable, that doesn't just mean for humans. That means every gene is not patented. So they'll find out. And then in this case, the Bowman case, this courageous farmer has gone all the way from district court, state court, district court, circuit court, right to the Supreme Court. And here's what he says. He says, all right, you got your patent. But it only, it, once I purchase your seed, your patent dies. I can save my seed. I have the right to save my seed. And that will be ruled on by the Supreme Court this spring. So I don't know if we're going to win, but how tremendous, and I'm not, I'm not taking credit for this, but how tremendous that so many of us and so have gone to this point where we're, the court is going to have to decide, and we will know, and if it decides the wrong way, we'll let them know too. We'll let them know too. But, you know, the, uh, obviously uh, the work is not done. Uh, and as Walter was saying, you know, particularly, you know, in Molokai, and here, when we see the invasion of these companies. And I, I want to say something, you know, Monsanto, I love suing Monsanto. I, I'm just going to tell you right out. You know, I'm ne I, I, you know I, I don't, I never suffer from being passive aggressive because we just get to sue them, you know? And uh, it doesn't hurt that Monsanto's uh, chief attorney, a very nice guy, by the way, is named Phil Perry, who happens to be Dick Cheney's son-in-law. I mean, it makes victory a little sweeter. I'm not always a nice guy, you know? But I want to really make sure that we know that there are five major companies, including in this state, that have equal reputations to our friends at Monsanto. And let, let, let's just read them out here. There's Monsanto, sure, but Dow. Dow Chemical is one of the worst corporations ever, ever. There's DuPont, there's Syngenta, and there's Bayer. Dow AgriScience, that's Dow, yeah. So what I'm saying, and by the way, just three of those companies. Pioneer is, Pioneer is, is a subsidiary of DuPont. See, I know my stuff, guys. Uh, and Monsanto, DuPont, Syngenta own 51% between them of all the world's commercial seats. Mm -hmm. So let's not, when we talk about Monsanto, let's make sure we let Dow, DuPont, Syngenta, and Bayer have theirs too, huh? Because they're here and they need to... Yeah, so let's make sure we add them to it. And let's clear up, you know, let's clear up some, some myths here, by the way. You know, they come in, well, that's, how can you oppose GE crops when they're going to feed the world? All right? PBS. I mean, you see this all the time. It drives me absolutely crazy. You know, you know, check out the 2009 report by the Union of Concerned Scientists. It has a very good title. It's called Failure to Yield. And it's about what has actually happened with genetic engineered crops. As a matter of fact, genetic engineered soy and a number of others actually have a reduction in yield. All right? And then there's this thing that they increase nutrition. They don't increase nutrition. There's not a single genetic engineered crop that increases nutrition. The one that drives me the most crazy, though, is that they reduce the use of pesticides. All right, let's go over those five corporations again. We got Monsanto, Dow, you gotta memorize this by the end of my talk, DuPont, Bayer, Syngenta, what are all those companies? Chemical companies, what do you think they sell if they're chemical? Chemicals. So what they have done, they haven't done anything for Africa, the, the, the lame shall not walk, the blind shall not see, the hungry shall not be fed. They have created, 85% of all the crops out there are designed so they can withstand huge, huge applications of weed killers. Normally, if you, the weed killer hits not just the weed, but the crop, the crop dies. They came up with a trick. They inserted a bacteria into these crops. And so now you can spray as much herbicide as you want on them. Good for the company. They sell the seeds and they sell the herbicides. Some large farmers, hey, I don't have to be careful with my herbicide application. I can just aerial spray. 
Look, the soy doesn't die. Look, the corn doesn't die. What a miracle. Right? So every year, 115 million more pounds of herbicides are poured on our crops. 115 million. One, one, five. By comparison, all the work we've done with organic, and I'm proud to say that I was one of the people that put together the Organic Food Production Act in 1990, and we defend organic like crazy. You know, defend the standards, evolve the ethic, right? Um, we, with all the work we've done, we're replacing about, we're, we're getting rid of about 40 million pounds of pesticides. They're putting 115 million more. But now something's happened. The biotechnology companies, and they, they've met Charles Darwin, right? They didn't do their biology 01. We did, and we've been doing it for years, saying, if you spray 115 million more pounds of this Roundup on weeds, what's going to happen to the weeds? Yeah, adaption. All right, survival of the fittest. The weeds that can survive, survive, and they replicate, so we have 20 million acres in the United States where you can't kill those weeds with Roundup. Right? So the solution is... Yeah, Dow said, Dow Chemicals, our friend Dow Chemicals said, you know what? This is great. We can take over the market and we can have 2,4-D resistant crops. 2,4-D, which is one of the elements in Agent Orange. So, so then there's sort of a chemical arms race because then Monsanto says, oh, we're going to go with that cam. And by the way, these crops right now, these crops right now are up for approval at the USDA. This is not like some future, this is science fiction. Now, dicamba is one of the most terrifying weed killers of all because it volatilizes. That means under certain warm and wet conditions, it comes back up in a cloud after it's been sprayed and can move miles and drop on an organic farm and kill everything there. We even have huge uh, conventional farmers saying we don't want this thing. So our work is not done. And perhaps one of the most, for me, one of the most troubling things, which is up for approval right now and the FDA, which still has not promulgated the regulations for our food safety, but has found time to finalize the approval of a genetically engineered salmon. Now, the salmon was originally engineered with human growth genes to make it grow larger, faster, and now they put some pout genes in it to do the same thing. Independent scientists have said that fish like this, 60 fish like this, if they're released into a population of 60,000 native salmon, native fish can cause extinction in 30 generations. So one thing you can do right away is Right now, there's about 45 days left. The FDA wants to hear what you have to say about this salmon. They could destroy native salmon that has less omega-3. Actually, it's, it's a product with no associated with email. So please, go to the, food, the Center for Food Safety website, which is just Center for Food Safety in one word, and you can comment directly to the FDA. We're trying to get millions and millions of signatures to say, don't do this. And by the way, please do that. If there's anybody in this audience that doesn't do that, I'll be upset. <laughs> and you should be upset. This salmon is just, you know, I love salmon. I, admittedly, I fish for them constantly. And maybe I'm just trying to make up for being so cruel to these salmon over all the years I've fished. But seriously, this is a, a, a crisis that we need to stop right away. Um, by the way, the, the labeling petition it now has 1.25 million people that have told the Obama administration, you better label genetic engineered foods. It is the largest response they've ever had at the FDA. You can still do that as well. You can comment on that as well. So two things I want to just talk about. One is the process of genetic engineering. The process of genetic engineering is cell invasion technology. I mean, let's take a, how do you get a flounder, right? I mean, how, how do you get that gene into a tomato? Well, what they do is they attach the genetic construct they want. This could be the same with a growth gene and a salmon. They attach it to a vector. It can be a bacteria, a virus that invades the cell. The cell tries to reject it. They put in viruses to promote that. And then in every one of those cells, they put an antibiotic marker system. It's usually canamycin or ampicillin that, that these little bugs are, are, are resisting. So in every cell of every food, genetic engineered food, You've got the genetic construct that's never been there before. You've got a vector that invades the cell, virus or bacteria that's never ever been there before. You've got virus promoters to try and stop the cell from doing what it does naturally, which is reject this invasion. And then you've got this thing they need to check on to make sure it got in, these antibiotic marker systems. And the last thing on earth we need right now is something that makes us more resistant to antibiotics. That's in every cell of every genetic engineered food. So when they come anywhere and tell you that this is natural, it's like beer or yeast, 
you know what to tell them. No, not FY. That's not good. <laughs> so, I also wanted a little bit today to reflect on how does this happen? You know? I mean, there's the story of Native Americans and, uh, and they, they're by a river and uh, they see, they're washing their clothes, these women are washing their clothes, and they see a baby coming down the river. And they're terrified, they run out and they save the baby. And then they see two babies coming down the river, and they run on the river, and they save the two. And then suddenly three babies, and four babies, and five babies, and now, now everyone's just crazy saving these babies. And then the, the chief comes in and she says, maybe we should go upstream and see who's throwing the babies in the river, you know? So while we fight every one of these battles, they, the magnificent battle, which is so beautiful to watch, by the way, and I know some of you, you know, to stop this grotesque ferry, uh, the battles we're having, each one of us with genetic engineering foods, stop a factory, save a river, every one of those battles are important. We need to stop the bleeding. But unless we deal with the consciousness that is behind all these things, unless we begin to try and understand it, not just out there, but also in ourselves, uh, there's not enough of us to stop all the bleeding. So we don't just need to work like hell to stop the bleeding. We also, I think, need to spend a little bit of time thinking, what, why would you do this? You know? I mean, it's beautiful ceremony we started. I'm beautiful, the earth. How abundant. Why are you doing this? You know, I, years ago, I went to a USDA uh, research center out in Beltsville, Maryland. It's about 45 minutes from Washington, D.C. And I was doing a book at the time, and uh, I visited a man named Vern Purcell. He's a researcher, nice guy a researcher uh, out there, and he was putting human growth genes into pigs to see if pigs could grow faster and larger. This seems to be an obsession with these people, by the way. And uh, so I said, why are you doing this? And he said, well, the pig isn't sufficiently efficient. <laughs> so I said, may I see the pig, pig 6706? And he said, sure. And I, I looked at this pig, it could not stand up because somehow the human growth genes had the musculature overwhelm the skeleton. So it was collapsing in on itself. And its legs were about that big, just stubbles, could not stand up. It was, it, it, it was cross-eyed, impotent, and could barely move. And I was horrified. And I said, Dr. Purcell, I mean, what have you done here? And he looked at me rather cheerfully and said, hey, the Wright brothers didn't succeed the first time either. And remember what we just said about patenting. You only have this manufacturers or machines. There seems to be some kind of fatal confusion going on between machines and life here. You know, they're treating seeds, they're treating animals as their machines and using the, the machine values on these life forms. That's what we call the genetic engineering. This is a mechanism sort of a mechanistic pathology. This confusion, this technologization of life, which then follows in as patenting, as if you were patenting a refrigerator. So I begin to look into this, and I realize that there's sort of a, I call this kind of a cold evil. This idea that you can somehow treat life as if it was a machine. And I begin to look at some of the principles that are behind this. And one of them is um, a wrong view of science. One of the views is that science and technology are the same thing. And let me give you an example of this, the, the, the foolishness that comes from this misguided science. First of all, you know, my daughter is here filming somewhere, Kailani. Oh, my daughter Kailani is here. And if you were to ask me, Andy, what about your daughter Kailani? And I'd say, well, she's five, six, seven, weighs 110. Don't get insulted, honey, or 115. Um, and she's 98% water. And... Uh, some calcium. I'd say, that's not your daughter. I want to know about your daughter. But this kind of mistake of a quantification versus qualification is a real problem with our science, and it had an enormous effect on genetic engineering. Let me give you an example. Do people remember the Human Genome Project? You remember the genes we were supposed to have? Anybody? We're supposed to have 100,000 genes because we're very complicated. 
Well, it turns out we only had 19,000 genes. Surprising. We, it's kind of insulting. <laughs> well, they recently did the genome of wheat. Do you know how many genes wheat has? 80,000. 80,000 genes. We have 19. So if you take four Nobel Prize winners, Watson, Crick, Berg, and Borlaug, together they don't have this amount of genes of wheat. <laughs> Pinot Noir, Pinot Noir has 40,000 genes, which makes sense, it's very complex, very complex, and certainly more complex than most of the Republicans I deal with in Congress, okay, okay. <laughs> A uh, cheap show, okay, I'm, I'm entitled. Uh, corn has 35,000. Uh, oysters have 22,000. 3,000 more than we have. Houston, we have a problem with the gene theory. A big problem. Also, we share all but 375 genes with mice. Now, mice are nice. Don't get me wrong. But 375, that's all? And by the way, they have more genes than we do, too. <laughs> so their reductionist science is complete. They, they don't understand the first thing about life, much less about the genome, much less about anything else. But nevertheless, they try and force the science on us, and they try and push us into silence by saying, you don't know the science. All right? The other thing they try and push on us is, you know, you guys are wonderful, wise, beautiful, but what is the number one thing that you want in a machine? Efficiency. Exactly. Efficiency is minimum input for maximum output in minimum time. That's how they want us to treat everything. All right, let's go back to my daughter. I have a daughter, you know. And what if I told you I was a father who was extremely efficient? Minimum input of money and time and energy for maximum input of good grades and good behavior and, of course, minimum time, you know. Good dad? No, I don't think so. Uh, I have an English setter, I love English setters, that is the least efficient relationship ever. <laughs> I mean, I, food, affection, complete, and she does no work at all. Uh, she pees on the rug occasionally, eats an occasional baseball glove, sure. But that's about it. I mean, a friend calls you at midnight, you know, hey, Bob just left me, I'm sorry, I've got to give a speech tomorrow, inefficient friend. What do we treat the things we really care about with? Efficiency or something else? What's the other thing we treat things we really care about with? Love. Yeah, when was the last time you heard that in a legislature or a courtroom? But, you know, Lincoln said something. He said, you know, the best warriors are the lovers. He said, people who make war just for war are not good warriors. They'll fight for any side. They'll quit when they want. But if you're a lover, if you're a lover of seed, if you're a lover of the land, if you're a lover of rivers, if you're a lover of animals, you will fight. You will fight for that. Lovers are the best fighters. Well, then they're going to tell you that's fine, but you guys aren't. How are we going to be competitive? All right? How are you going to be competitive? Well, let's go back to my kids again. I have also have a son, Nicholas, not just Kailani, and they come back with their report cards. Kailani has an A, Nicholas has a B. Nicholas, you're the weakest link. Goodbye. Sorry, it's competition, son. <laughs> competition is the ethic of elimination. If you base your entire society based on competition, it is always based on elimination and someone losing. If, you, if people say, we're in a global competition in economics in the marketplace, we have to win over other countries, that means you're condemning those countries to unemployment, to poverty, starvation. If you go to any anthropology, they will tell you, we did not survive by competition, we survived by what? Cooperation. That's why we love cooperatives. That is why, that is how we will survive as a species, through co cooperation, and not just cooperation with each other. Co cooperation with every other creature on Earth. It is long overdue that we realize that human economy needs to be a wholly owned subsidiary of ecology. Until we have... Until we have learned that human competition plays no role whatsoever, I mean, it's laws of supply and demand, Tunas did not read, tuna fish, have, you know, they haven't read Adam Smith. They don't know they're supposed to produce more when people want more. Topsoil had never read Adam Smith. There's not a single thing in nature that responds to human supply and demand. So we have an entire economic system that is virtually autistic to the actual rules. 
of ecology in this earth. That's pathological. So don't, uh, don't give me competition. That means you know nothing about how this world works and how we're going to have to work in this world if we're going to survive. I mean, the world will, earth will survive anyway. People say, help save the earth. No, no, help save us here. I would just be, it would just be so much nicer if we could see it when it got saved and be here. The other thing they always tell me, they always say, and this happened to me actually, the bird after, he says, you know, you're a smart guy, but it seems to me you're against progress. Right? So not only, you know, do you, are you unscientific, inefficient, uncompetitive, but you're also against progress. And I always say, progress, that's an incomplete sentence. Progress towards what? Progress towards what? I mean, is the way we treat 10 billion animals that we eat and these horrifying concentration camps, really, that we call concentrated animal food operations, is that progress? Is patenting all of life progress? Is genetically engineering the seed away from its, it, it, its refulgency, its resilience into something you, can, you only can use for one year and that actually is invented to resist pesticide, the destruction of the most profound symbol of fecundity we have on Earth, is that progress? No, they don't get to decide progress, we get to decide progress. We get to say, that is not progress. And not just us, the UN just came out with a report, the ISTAD report, that said the way we're gonna feed the world, this is the United Nations, the biggest experts in the world that said, is not through genetic engineering, is not through toxic inputs, is not through pesticides, is not through the 2,4-D and the dicamba and the Roundup that is in the dust, that's in Molokai, and that's hurting and killing children on that island and on this island. So we know it is these toxic herbicides that's in that dust. That is not progress. That can never be progress. And certainly having plants where we're now going from Roundup to 2,4-D to Dicamba, can't, I mean, that's going backwards. That's chemical arms race going backwards. And sooner or later, I mean, this is again, biology 01. What is gonna happen to these weeds? You won't be able to kill them with Roundup. You won't be able to kill them with 2,4-D. You won't be able to kill them with Dicamba. And according to Dave Mortensen at Penn State, that will mean 700, 800 million more pounds of these toxic herbicides all over the world being experimented on ground zero right here, right? They'll be resistant to it. We will have hundreds of millions of acres of weeds. You can't get rid of anything. But meanwhile, these companies will have made zillions in selling their seeds and their chemistry, and then they can just walk away. That's this nightmare that, that they're giving us. That's a nightmare that we need to stop, and that can't possibly be seen as progress by anyone. So we will define progress, not them. We will take over. We'll, we'll occupy progress. And one last consciousness thing, I mean, as, we, as we have a system that's based not in efficiency, and efficiency is fine for machines, but for a living system that's based in love and cooperation, right? And it's based in our vision of progress. We have to get rid of some of the ways we think about it. I have to get rid of some of the ways we think about ourselves. And one of those is, is consumers. We've been told that this is a great consumer movement. Consumer? Talk about a mechanistic idea. I mean, they used to call it tuberculosis, tuberculosis consumption because it destroyed the bodies of its victims. You know, fires consume buildings. They would love us to remain passive consumers. There are no passive consumers on this island, I know that. But I'm saying, all over, in other places there are. And that's the responsibility of each of us. We're not consumers, whether we like it or not. Each of us is a creator, like Walter said. You know, whether we like it or not, every decision we will make in the food we grow, in the food we buy, the food we feed our children, the food that we allow in our schools and our communities is either going to progress this terrifying industrial mechanistic nightmare that has now reached its end point in the actual engineering of the seed to become tolerant to these horrifying toxic poisons or the organic and beyond, which is the fastest growing sector in American agriculture, which means organic, local, appropriate scale, humane, and boy, I mean that with the, my full heart. Biodiverse and socially just. We need to defend the organic ethic, but we need to evolve that ethic into local, into appropriate scale, humane, socially just, and biodiversity. That's the, the house. Organic isn't the ceiling. Organic's the floor. And above that, we build this new house of food. And we're only gonna build it not in competition, we're gonna build it in, in, in cooperation. And by the way, let me just say, when we, consumer versus creator isn't just about food. Don't just read a poem. And I'm talking to myself too, by the way. Not just, I'm not on top of this mountain. I don't always make the right decisions. But don't just read a poem, write a poem. 
Don't just listen to music, though it's great to listen to music. You know, write music. Don't just eat food, grow food. Yeah, that's the way to do it. Don't just watch romantic movies, make love. Sit, stop sitting there crying and do something about it. So creators, not consumers, and participants, because remember, we're creating only within the context of the laws of ecology, the rules of this great earth. We're not just creators against it. I want to finish uh, by, uh, which I often do, for those who have heard me speak before, with, um, with a quote from one of my great heroes, uh, Wendell Berry. Uh, yeah. And uh, you want to try and quote Wendell accurately because he writes so beautifully that it would be a sin, I think a mortal sin in the Catholic Church to misquote him. Um, and Wendell says, um, to live, we must daily break the body and shed the blood of creation. When we do it knowingly, lovingly, skillfully, and reverently, it is a sacrament. When we do it greedily, clumsily, cruelly, destructively, it is a desecration. The industrial model has tried to mechanize life. You know, everything on life, there is no unsacred thing on this earth. There's only things that have been desecrated. And in this desecration of our food, I call it the one night stand. You know, you don't care, it's just eat it, don't care where it came from, where it goes. This desecration not only creates the environmental and health damages, I mean, we no longer have adult onset diabetes because so many children have it. And we have an epidemic of cancers, as people in this community know, and childhood leukemia from the toxic poisons of pesticides and herbicides. So not only does that desecration create all those terrible things, but it also puts each of us not just into a health crisis or a ecological crisis, but into a moral crisis. Because it's the job of each of us, including me, not to take part in that desecration anymore. Never again. Hard to do. But the great thing about the food movement is that we can start that right now. You can say, no, I will, I will. we have a, a guide on our website. You never have to eat GMOs again. We can tell you exactly how to, no. Please, never, ever, ever, ever eat industrial meat. Don't do it. You're, you're complicit in one of the great crimes of modernity. Talking to myself too. Don't do it. And the other thing about that desecration is it has spiritual impacts on us. Right? It's a world of loneliness, a world of selfishness. And it is a world of efficiency, competition, wastefulness, destructiveness, clumsiness, all those things. So, as you go to the legislature and make sure that a labeling bill is passed this year, as you fight every battle here, I hope we all together, in cooperation, in, in love, can with, can knowingly, skillfully, lovingly, and most important for me, reverentially, come together to create a new food future. Thank you.